Dave. There we go, you got it. Cool. Good evening, everyone. We're going to open our meeting this evening with a hymn and then a prayer. So hymn 183, inspire the ancient seers who wrote from thee the sacred page, a light for all succeeding years, a lamp in this degenerate age, hymn 183. Do you need me to stop sharing mine first? Yeah, I think that's the problem, yeah. Sorry, I just realised that. Apologies. No, no problem, man.
So we'll continue with a word of prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and holy name. We approach unto you now through your Son, the Lord Jesus, praying for your Son's soon return to establish your kingdom. We thank you, Father, that we can open the pages of your word and understand your thoughts and your mind and your plan and purpose with the earth and that we have evidence of your existence through Israel, that miracle of Israel, and, and also through the fact that your word has been contained in scrolls all down the ages. And so as we look at these things this evening, we pray that you'll bless us all as we look at the miracle of your word of truth. We ask this prayer now for your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So this evening we have uh, Brother Ben Collard, and he's shortly going to speak to us on the subject, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Evidence of Bible Authenticity. And Ben, I forgot to ask you, have you got a reading to introduce your subject? Would you be happy to read for me? Um, Second of Peter, um, chapter one and verse 16 to the end. Thank you. Okay, Second of Peter, chapter one and verses 16 to the end. Thank you. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, that he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto we ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Basically, okay, so with that short introduction, then over to Brother Ben. Thank you very much. So let's have uh, a think about uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls then. And we're looking at them as evidence of Bible authen authenticity. So let's uh, let's see our, our first slide. Hopefully I can work that. There we go. Super. So let's just have a look at what we've we've just read. We've read from 2 Peter chapter 1 and those verses there. And we've got a claim, haven't we, from the Bible here. It's not cunningly devised fables. It's not made up stories. That's that's what the Bible is claiming here. It is actually the powerful word of God. Um, and it's not what what men have just made up themselves. Scripture is not from men, but it's given by the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God. And so that's the claim that we have here in the record in scripture isn't it <clears throat> and so if we believe this claim and if we can prove that scripture has not been changed since it was actually given then what we have here is indeed the word of God and it is those powerful words from him which we can rely upon so the whole point of what we're going to try to do um, this evening is to see how accurate it actually is from the time it was initially written up until uh, today. So how, is this record that we've got, is it actually um, what was written in the first place? So that's really our aim. So um, let's have um, a little think about that now. <clears throat> I was first uh, interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I suppose, in, in about 2009, um, when Becky and I, we went to Canada one summer and we visited the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Well, they say Toronto, don't they? So uh, there we go. And when the, the, the ROM, uh, the, the, the Royal Ontario Museum, the ROM was offering, in their words, a once in a lifetime opportunity to see these historical treasures. And it was, I've got the little, uh, little booklet here. 
you can see that it was uh, all about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which uh, and the little tagline there. I don't know whether you can read that words that changed the world, it says. And so we went along and we had a look at that exhibition. It was absolutely fascinating, thoroughly fascinating. And in fact, it, you know, fr from that point, I, I felt that uh, some of the talks that maybe I'd heard from, from Christadelphian platforms had given me a certain idea about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I almost felt I had to do a bit of myth busting in a sense. So as part of uh, the, the talk this evening, what we're going to actually do, um, there were a few questions for you. And I'm really interested to see what your your responses to those are, because, I, you know, before I went to to that exhibition and then did a bit of subsequent research, I would have said, you know, I wouldn't have got the answers right at all. So if, if you don't get them right, it, it's no um, it's no reflection on you at all. It's it'll be just an interesting thing to do. So this is what uh, somebody was saying, a poll, what's this? So we've got some questions for you, okay? We're not talking about great poles of, of wood and metal. We're talking about some questions which I'm going to share with you now. So the first one, okay, I'm gonna start a, a poll now, launch this. And the question that we've got, um, actually before I do that, I'll put it up on this this screen here so you can see the options here okay what do the dead sea scrolls contain a old testament scriptures b new testament scriptures c rules about being an Essene. we'll come to what that means later d scriptural commentaries okay so they're your options and i'm going to launch this poll and i'm hoping that somehow on your screen okay you will be able to put a vote for for one or of those one which you think uh i can see we've got five percent ten percent voted this is very exciting this is uh so three out of 19 attendees have now voted four that's good you you'll have a you've got uh, 20 seconds to post okay uh this is good seven out of 19 now uh, a few more seconds okay um so uh I don't know, can, can other people see the results of this on the screen coming up? I don't know. Can, can you see that? Or am I, uh, I think I'm gonna end the poll now, actually. I think I, I'm able to do that. So if I end that now, and I don't know, can you see that now on your screen? What I can see? Hopefully you can. Anyway, we have 79% of those who voted said Old Testament scriptures. OK, nobody said New Testament scriptures. And then we had we had 14 percent. That was two people said uh, it it contains rules about being an Essene. OK, and then uh, one person, seven percent of our poll there uh, said scriptural commentaries. OK, now I've kind of uh, set you up to fail here in a way. I think that it's all of them. OK, now uh, you, you might think very strange that I say New Testament scripture, but what I'm going to do towards the end of our uh, talk today um, is I'm going to share with you some evidence which I think um, suggests that it is possible that there is New Testament uh, scripture in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that will be um, very interesting to to look at that. Um, actually, I can share the results. I didn't see that. Can you see that on you should be able to see that on your screen there i apologize i'm uh, this is the first time i've done one of these uh before quite like that so you can see that now okay so let's have a look at um, a few other things before we have our next question so i've got an analogy for you next okay the analogy is my bookcase it's actually only over there yes just there you see <laughs> Uh, it looks tidier on the screen, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so if you have a look at that bookcase, you can see I've got some Old Testament Christadelphian works. All right. I've got some New Testament Christadelphian works. I've got thing, you know, meditations and exhortations. I've got um, I've got on, on the other side. Um, 
things about defending the faith and about Israel. I've got some some different Bible versions. I've got the King James. I've got the New King James ESV. Uh, I've got a Hebrew Bible. I've got a Greek. Uh, I've got an Italian Bible, various other things like that. Some commentaries as well. These ones here are uh, commentaries and there are dictionaries, encyclopedias, concordances, parallel scriptures as well. Really helpful when we're trying to piece together you know, which order things happen in the Gospels. I was using my uh, parallel Gospels uh, when I was preparing um, the, the exhortation for, for this morning about Zacchaeus to try and work out w- which order things happened in um, in the events surrounding that and Jesus way to Jerusalem. I put it to you, it's exactly the same with the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Exactly the same, but not for a Christadelphian, okay? But for an Essene, okay? As I've said, we'll think about what an Essene is in a moment or two. Uh, briefly, the Essenes were those people um, who, who, uh, who basically put, uh, collected all the these uh, texts together. Now, if I was to show you sort of over here, you can see I've got some other things on my shelves as well. I've got loads of folders. You can see that. Yeah. Um, now, those folders have things like um, I've got my mortgage documents in one of those folders somewhere up there, I believe. I've got um, an agreement that I signed and probably a work contract and all sorts of other things like that. Well, things like that were also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. So it was a very, uh, you know, it, it's a very much a library of different materials which have been collected by this group of people, the Essenes, over a period of time. So hopefully that that tells you a little bit about what they actually are. Now, from from listening to some talks, you would think, well, it's you know it's just Old Testament scripture, but actually there's a plethora of different things. Some from the canon of scripture, some inspired, and some which are apocryphal. They're not part of the canon of scripture, and some things which are just to do with living, you know, financial records and other such things um, as well. So. Go on to our next um, slide. We can see some of the things which um, have been found. Um, complete scrolls of some parts of scripture, including the great scroll of Isaiah. And we'll have a think um, about that particular document a little bit later. Complete scrolls of, of commentaries. Um, there's one particularly about Habakkuk. If you think about this one that I've got here, this is Dudley Fifield's commentary on the Psalms, isn't it? There are three volumes at it, the other two are up there. But, um, you know, we, as Christadelphians, we have things like that as well. And interestingly, I'll tell you this bit now, um, the great thing about having commentaries is that they have quotations, don't they? If I, if I just, um, I've opened this up at random, okay? And it's on Psalms 42 and 43, and there's a quotation here, okay? It's the it says, notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. OK, and that's from Numbers 26, verse 11. So you see, by looking at a commentary, you know, for instance, the commentary of Habakkuk in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are little snippets of quotations, you see, from Scripture. And so that's really helpful when we try and corroborate the scriptural record, because those little bits can be compared with the bigger scrolls to see whether there are errors and mistakes. You see, and and they can then uh, come together to form a better document, one which is tested uh, and tried. And we know that it's more accurate. So that that, I found that fascinating to to think about things like that. There's something called the community rule. Now, I'll show you another document that I've got here. Um, This is really interesting. It's uh, it's uh, a translation of different parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls by the Folio Society. Now, uh, if you it's a great it, it's a really interesting thing to, to get your hands on if uh, if you if you get the chance. So in, in that in cave four, there, there was something called the community rule. And it was all about the, the different rules for being an a scene, being part of that particular community of um of 
of people who, who were there looking after the scrolls and, and, you know, the scribes that were there. We have something called the Damascus document, the Messianic scroll. Well, I found that fascinating. That there's something called the Messianic scroll. OK, because, you know, I believe in a Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those who uh, who wrote the Messianic scroll, they, they didn't believe um, in, in Jesus. You know, they didn't believe he was the one who it was referring to. And in fact, they they believed in two messiahs. We'll come to that in a, a few moments, though. Um, and then we have something called the Temple Scroll. There's even one called the Exhortation. You know, I mean, that's that's really interesting, isn't it? When we think about um, the, the thing, you, you know, uh, each week we have an exhortation, don't we? Some encouragement. And these are scenes they called themselves the Sons of Light. That's that's fascinating, isn't it? When you think of all the, the scriptural um sort of uh, so patterns with, with light and, and, and so forth that we find in our Bibles. So let's move on then. I've got a few slides here, which um, basically little examples, snippets of the Dead Sea Scrolls here. So this is um, a lease agreement. I said it wasn't just scripture that we find, a lease agreement written in Hebrew. It's 33 lines long, contains four signatures of the foot, at the foot of it. And it's about land in Ein Gedi on behalf of uh, Simeon Bar Kosiba or Bar Kochba. Um, so that's that one. Um, the next one that we've got here, this is, uh, and we saw this, we saw this at the ROM in, in Canada. Uh, this is from Genesis 34 to 39. It's the account of Joseph. Uh, this particular piece of scroll is the account from Genesis 39 of Joseph's time in Potiphar's household. So uh, that's that's fascinating for us. This one here is um, from, from Deuteronomy. Um, there are 35, I think it's 35 or 36 scrolls were discovered in the case of, of the, the Judean desert. 32 of those at Qumran, one at Masada and one at Murabaet um, and one at Heva or Selim um, of Deuteronomy. So, so that's fascinating. Uh, from the Song of Moses there. We've got another little snippet here to have a look at. So we can see um, we've got the authorised version on the left and the Dead Sea Scrolls um, translation on the right hand side. And as we look across, you know, you know we, we can see, can't we, that they are the same text. There are a few differences, but it's like it's a little bit like, you know, some of you may have an authorised version on your laps. Some of you might have an NKJV. Some of you might have an ESV on your laps. OK, and it's it's a bit similar to that sort of thing. You can see the sense of it, but the translations that, that have come across um, potentially, you know, have small variations there. OK, the bits in, in brackets, some of those, those bits, um, have been corroborated for, from other scrolls. You know, perhaps if there's a bit of a gap, um, like on, on that picture there, if there's a little bit of a gap, you might miss part of a word or a word and have to go to another scroll where that word is shown to, to get the picture of that there. Okay. Um, what have I done? Here we go. Um, and here we've got some, some more little snippets there. Uh, which are just interesting to look at. We've got uh, the Messianic Apocalypse, which I was, was talking about earlier, which is obviously non-biblical. We've got some from the, the Psalms here. The code here means Cave 11 uh, at Qumran, the Q for Qumran, and then uh, the fifth item which was found in that cave, just so you understand um, how that works. We've got some more from the Psalms. There are 36 manuscripts from the Psalms. There's an Isaiah commentary as well. Um, there's something called the Book of War, which was, uh, which is apocryphal. It's not, it's not um, part of the canon of scripture. And something called the Damascus Covenant as well. You can see uh, quite a few items were found in that particular cave and quite a few in this one as well. Um, one of the best preserved manuscripts is from uh, Deuteronomy. It's the Ten Commandments. 
Um, it's an extremely small scroll, that one, which is uh, interesting to, to, um, to see. Okay, so we've got another question for you now then. Uh, it should appear on the screen here. So how many caves were found containing the scrolls and parchments that we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls? And what I'm going to do, uh, I've got a second poll for you here somewhere, um, which I'm going to share and launch now. So if you'd like to vote then for how many you, uh, you think there were, the eager-eyed of you will have spotted how many, you know, up to how many there were, um, on some of the previous slides from the first number in some of those codes. <laughs> so I'll give you a couple more, couple more seconds on that. You've got uh, 10 more seconds. Okay. There we go. So the, the winner at the moment going well into the lead is, is 12. Okay. With 21 just behind with 31% of the, the, the vote there. Um, I think we've got two people said nine and one person said seven as well. So I'm going to end that poll there and I'll share those results with you as well, if you can see that on the screen. OK, and indeed, uh, the, the you know, if, if you were playing a, a quiz show uh, and ask a friend, you, you would have got it right. Everybody well, ask the audience, I should say uh, the the, uh, the 12 caves was correct. I see a bit of celebration there from someone there. Fantastic. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so uh, it is indeed 12. That's correct. So let's just uh, hide that and go on to our next slide. This is a very interesting one as well. OK, so you can see on your screen, um, Kerbet Qumran at the... Um, at the top of the uh, Dead Sea. This is where the, the caves were found and where the compound is, where these Essenes um, had, where they, where they lived. Um, so so we, we've talked, haven't we, about the, the community rule for the, the Essenes, um, these teachers, these, these rabbis. Um, and this community rule is really interesting because um it's similar in some respect to like an apostolic constitution you know as um as as, as christadelphians we have the birmingham amended statement of faith don't we well this this uh, community rule that they had is sort of a similar style document um to what they had so that gives you a bit of a an idea uh, about them um and as I said, they call themselves they call themselves the Sons of Light. Obviously, they, this document is not an inspired um, document, um, but it's helpful to understand these people who have preserved these scrolls over so many years. Now, there is one theory which I will share with you, um, and that's that it could this could have been the abode of of John the Baptist. You see here at the bottom. There is uh, a ritual washing bath, like a baptismal bath. Um, and if I'll just read you a passage from Matthew 3. Um, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and was meat. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. You see, we know that John was a dweller in the wilderness, in the desert, you see. So that is a possibility. I've got no proof for that. So I, I'm only putting it out there as a possibility. But you see, ritual washing was important for this community, the washing a way of sins and this community rule that you read is littered with quotations from the law and mainly from deuteronomy and under point five um, under this constitution um, is, is as follows and this is the rule for the men of the community who have freely uh, pledged themselves to be converted from all evil and to cling to all his commandments according to his will and it goes on to say that they were expected to go through this uh, ritual uh, washing process. And as I said, they were expecting 
um, they, they talk about the Messiah in a lot of their documents. And that's interesting. They were expecting two messiahs, a priest and a king. Now, we know, don't we, from our New Testament scriptures that these were, in fact, one person. And that is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So some interesting things there to to get you you thinking about what these uh, what these scrolls actually are. I've got another one for you then. Uh, Another question. Let me just I'm going to have to just move the uh, the pictures over a little bit. Just a moment. Um, So there are two questions on this poll. okay, which I'll share with you now. And they are as follows. Where are the scrolls stored now? And you have four options. The Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, the Shrine of the Book, the Qumran Museum or the Dome of the Rock. And the second question um, is how many languages were the scrolls written in? One, two, four or five. Okay, so I'm going to launch that poll now. I'll give you uh, about a minute or so to uh, pop your answers into those. You've got um, two, two questions to respond to there. Okay, I can't see any, any results coming in yet. So, oh, so somebody's now done that, thank you. I was getting worried that you couldn't see it or something. <laughs> but that's, that's good. Ah, so we've got, uh, so I'll just, just give you a quick update. We're halfway through our poll and um, the Kung Ran Museum seems to be doing quite well with 46% of the vote, closely followed by 38% with the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. Um, languages, we have um, 46%, is tied on 46% with two languages or four languages and one person, 8% of our vote is saying five languages. Okay. Nobody went for one. All right. So thankfully nobody's gone for the dome of the rock because that was, that was a red herring put in there. Okay. (laughs) Good. I'm going to end that poll there then. And you can see the, the results there as I described. Okay. And I'll just, um, I'll just go on to the next um, page of our presentation. Um, It is indeed, um, it's actually the Shrine of the Book B, okay, is where they are stored now. Now, they used to be stored in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, okay? The Qumran Museum, I actually made that one up. It doesn't exist. Um, And obviously, it's not the Dome of the Rock, okay? So it is the Shrine of the Book. And we'll just have a little picture of that on this slide. You can see over on the right hand side here, this is a picture of um, the, the uh, this is a picture of the, the shrine of the book here, you see. And it's really interesting because these, these jets of water going up on the outside, they're actually to cool this so that it's the ambient temperature to preserve the scrolls inside. I thought that was quite an interesting little uh, little point there to to throw in but uh, as I said they were formerly stored in the Rockefeller Museum there's a picture of the Rockefeller Museum there in Jerusalem Um, and we also have um, we have a picture here of um, Khalil Eskander Shahin or Kando he was a cobbler turned antiques dealer who purchased the first scroll from Mohammed Ed Dib he was a Bedouin shepherd who discovered them in 1947. Okay, and this picture at the bottom here, the bottom right, is the scrollery um, where these uh, where these pieces of um, of text were analysed and and looked at. Now, just to give you an idea, the, some of the the fragments are extremely small. I mean, the Great Scroll of Isaiah is a pretty complete thing, uh, and so uh, one commentator called them the Dead Sea confetti you know it's that sort of some of them are that sort of size and they've been analyzed there okay so let's go on to our other question that we had okay which was how many languages were the scrolls written in well I'm going to say to you um, I think most people would say four okay 
but you could make a case for five. OK, so let me let me just um, explain that now. Um, <clears throat> so we've definitely got Hebrew and Greek, Aramaic and also Arabic. Um, there are some um, there is some. Uh, some, some agreements and sort of legalistic things written in Arabic, which are agreements with people from the surrounding area. OK. Um, but also in a cave very close by, which isn't technically, I think, one of the, the Dead Sea um, caves, there has been some Latin found as well, including um, a Roman soldier's payslip, a list of hospital supplies and a quotation from Virgil's Iliad, clearly left uh, soon after AD 70 by some by some Roman soldiers who were stationed there. OK, so that they're all your questions now. OK, so there's no more questions uh, for you now. OK, but why is this so exciting? Why is this? Why, why have I told you all those facts? Really, they're just loads of different facts about the Dead Sea Scrolls, aren't they? Well, this is why. This is why I'm extremely excited uh, about this. It, AD 900, <coughs> around AD 900, were the previous oldest versions of the Scroll of Isaiah in the Masoretic text. OK, and but the Dead Sea uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know those caves were sealed, okay, um, around about AD 68, when the Romans took Qumran and the caves then were left, they were, were sealed at that point. And we know what happened in AD 70, when the Romans then took Jerusalem. So, so what, what this is, is showing us, that, that these texts, they are 900 years older than the previous oldest text. That is astounding. And it's something to, to really grasp hold of and to understand. And in fact, when you think about it, you know, AD 68 is just, um, that's the date the caves were sealed, isn't it? Okay. Now, if you look, if you were to look again at my bookcase, I've got books on that bookcase which are way, you know, I, I didn't just buy them all uh, for today just to show you, you know. I, I, some of those are a lot older than I am, you know. So if you take back, some of those scrolls were obviously written a lot longer before um, AD 68 as well. So we can actually take the scrolls back to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, some of them. Some of them would have been newer, of course. But that is um, a fascinating thing um, to, to think about. <clears throat> and so we could say, potentially, you know, scrolls of, of a similar age, possibly even one of these scrolls, may have been uh, one that the Lord Jesus Christ would have been able to see. I find that utterly fascinating and uh, remarkable. Now, if you take, for example, the biographies of Alexander the Great, okay, these were written about 400 years after his death, but, but they're evident. It, it isn't disputed at all. The Annals of Tacitus were written about 100 AD, but the earliest manuscripts we have left are about 850 AD. So you can see and um, there's a huge gap in time. And so we can see that for 2000 years, these scrolls had been lying untouched away from the elements, ready for their discovery in 1947 by a Bedouin uh, shepherd. So let's have a little look at, um, at this one. Now, the, the other thing about these is the sheer volume of them as well. This isn't just one scroll that's been found. It's fascinating. We, we've got the top 10 in terms of numbers of scrolls. OK, so for the Psalms, we've got um, 37, uh, Deuteronomy 36, Genesis 22, Isaiah 21. You can see down the list. I don't need to read it out. <laughs> uh, and then you see on the other side, these are uh, these are texts which have quotations from 
those particular books as well. So if you remember my example from, from Dudley Fifield and his volume on the, on the Psalms, okay, most of it is his writing, but it inserted into that are little quotations which are inspired bits of scripture, aren't they? Okay, and that's exactly what this data is showing us over here. There are 79 uh, uh, scrolls uh, with quotations uh, from the Psalms. There are 66 uh, scrolls with quotations from the prophecy of Isaiah and 54 with quotations from the prophecy of Deuteronomy, which can then be looked at and corroborate those parts which um, they are taken from. OK, so let's move on. Um, I when I saw this next slide, I have to say I, I was shaken a little bit. OK, because when you look at that data, it, it, it's it's quite it's quite um, scary to think. If I say this to you, there are one thousand three hundred and ninety six differences between the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Scroll of Isaiah. And this to me sounds a little bit worrying when I first read that. But when you look at this data which um, this is, is put together. This was, this was in the Testimony magazine, okay? I don't know whether you saw this, this one, the, the Wonder of Isaiah. And a brother, uh, Jay Mayock, um, did, he, he, I think he probably did his dissertation on uh, the, the Dead, sea Scroll, Dead Sea Scrolls and, and the, the Great Scroll of Isaiah. And he analyzed every single variant OK, between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Mas Masoretic text. Let me just go back to that um, previous slide. Um, oops, too many. This one. So the Masoretic text, that was the one here and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the, those ones there. OK, so he's, he's gone through, analysed each one and he's looked at whether they are significant. OK. So um, if we go through these ones um, together, I've got them on this screen to, to sort of help you, you see and understand those. Um, we've got 75 variants, which are just to do with spellings. Now, if you think about it, if you go to say um, Kings or Chronicles, yeah, and you read those lists of the Kings from different parts of scripture, they, they're sometimes, spelt differently aren't they or the names are are given you know different kings were known sometimes by several different names so those 75 are are very much um just to do with things like that okay spellings of names which have virtually no effect on the translations into english some are grammar or copying errors OK, uh, now, translationally, these make no difference to what we have uh, we have in English. And um, the only particular omission was in Isaiah four verses five and six, where a whole clause is missing. However, this is a fragment. Uh, th there's a fragment of this clause, which is on another scroll. OK, and so it's just an error which was only there in the great scroll of Isaiah and it's corroborated. It's it's then picked up by another scroll that we have. OK, single words. Um, we can see there's 356 variants of those. Well, they're usually and or the. OK, things like that. Now, when you read um, through and, and, and perhaps miss a word like that, they'd never compromise the sense of, of what we're reading. We have 718, which are single to multiple words. Um, and these are often synonyms for, for words where a word with the same meaning has been substituted. Let me give you an example. One, one place that I, I've given this talk, they announced it as um, the Dead Sea Scrolls evidence of Bible authority. OK, now the actual title is authenticity, you see, but actually it pretty much means the same thing, doesn't it? It gives uh, it gets across what I was was trying to say. And so it is a synonym which uh, the president on that occasion just popped in. OK, um, some are full clauses. 
And there are four variants of, of those. For example, in Isaiah 38, verse 6, and an addition is present in the older Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, for my sake and for my servant David's sake. And it's about deliverance from Assyria. But of course, in the parallel account of 2 Kings 20, verse 6, that phrase is then present in our authorised version. You see, so, so it is there in the record, but it's just been put in a slightly different place. So we can understand, can't we, uh, uh, how that works. Now, there are um, some, 31, which are possibly significant, okay? But these can be explained through either parallelism. We're probably aware of what, what parallelism, giving us an example um, which, uh, which, which parallels with what we're trying to explain. And the immediate context, uh, word plays or puns, different Qumran variants, so other scrolls containing the Masoretic version, um, comparative exposition, or a sort of a common thread. Okay, so when I saw that evidence, my 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 mind was was put to ease, and and I I understood um, that actually it's a phenomenally accurate. Uh, translation that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls and it provides great comfort to me of the accuracy and authenticity and authority of the word of God. So this is uh, Yigail Yadin in the message of the scrolls and this is what he said. This, uh, there is no question that the overwhelming significance of the text lies in the fact that these scrolls, which are about a thousand years older than any Hebrew text hitherto discovered, vary only slightly from the text as it is known to us and used today. It thus proves the antiquity and authenticity of the Masoretic text. And um, he, he is a, a scholar who's worked with, uh, with these things. So I said, didn't I, at the start, that I would share with you a little bit of, of evidence um, for New Testament um, scrolls amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've got another little book somewhere here, which I want to just wave in front of you. You can see that on the screen. That's the, the little book there. It's by Bill Cooper. Um, he, he is a member of the creation science movement, which are a non-denominational um, organization. They, they believe in a, a young earth. They do have Trinitarian leanings as well, but he's written some fantastic, uh, really interesting uh, books on the subject of Genesis, Joshua, the authenticity of Joshua and of, of various other books of Daniel and Jonah uh, and lots of other books as well but this one is what we're thinking about th this this evening and he um he went through some evidence some findings in cave seven okay and he believes that there's evidence of uh part of one timothy three part uh the gospel of mark uh, segments from the the, the the gospel of mark acts right mark uh James, Romans, and 2 Peter. Now, that's why I had that one particularly read at the start, okay, because there is a, a fragment which seems to have come from 2 Peter uh, 1, and, and that's lovely, isn't it? We've actually read from that passage this evening at the start. Mark 6, and then a commentary on Romans. Well, I personally find that utterly staggering. If you if you think back to that previous um, slide, this one here, yeah. If you think, well, you know, uh, Romans had to therefore have been written by AD sixty eight, okay, a and then somebody to have sat down and written a commentary about it by AD 68. Well, that really puts Romans in a very strong position, doesn't it? Uh, and I find that phenomenally fascinating there. OK, let's go back to, to here. Now, there is a little bit of intrigue surrounding cave 
number seven. And I want to share that with you. Um, I would recommend that you get a copy of uh, of this book and have a little read of it because it's it's very interesting and it's not very long. It's it's only what how many pages? It's only it's less than eighty pages that one. So it's well worth a read. So nineteen fifty five Cave Seven's contents, apart from Exodus and an apocryphal letter of Jeremiah, all other fragments were considered unidentifiable. Okay. Then in 1972, a papyrus called Dr. Jose O'Callaghan discovered that these fragments belong to the New Testament. This was his, his bombshell that he, he brought. And so, so it means that I, I've gone through that bit, haven't I? OK, and, and it must mean that the New Testament components were written in the eyewitness period of AD 30 to 70. O'Callaghan was then totally ridiculed. All the scholars of the time said he was he was barking mad and told him that that it was utter nonsense. And then in 1991, Cave 7 mysteriously collapsed or, or potentially was destroyed. And of course, that prevented further examination of that particular cave. Now, if you think about it, if you're from um, the Israeli Antiquities Authority, and there's something which which might give authenticity, not just to the Old Testament, to, but potentially to the New Testament. You wouldn't really want that to come out, would you? You see. And, and so the thought is that potentially there might have been some intrigue surrounding this a bit of a conspiracy theory for you, if you like. <laughs> and so yeah i mean that cave had been there for an awful long time for two thousand years there's very little rain or erosion and things that take place um so it is pretty extraordinary that it just collapsed so i put it to you that that i i believe that that it's a wonderful piece of evidence of the authenticity of the new testament in the dead sea scrolls Another little thing that I should throw in here. Some of the fragments are extremely small, but you know when you do a jigsaw, yeah? You, you, the, the thing about a jigsaw is the best thing is to get the, the cover, isn't it? And then work out, you try and do the edge piece, you get the corners, don't you? And then you get the edge pieces and then you gradually fill in the middle bit, okay? I'm sure we've all done jigsaws. Well, it's exactly the same with the papyrists. You see, they've got the cover, yeah, that's the um, that's the Masoretic text, isn't it? The cover, in a sense, they know what it should look like, and so uh, uh, and they're finding edge pieces, and some of those uh, some of the New Testament fragments were indeed edge pieces. Okay, and when they find things like that, they can be pretty sure. And O'Callaghan was was very sure that he'd found parts of the New Testament. Okay. Well, uh, we've covered a, a lot of ground, haven't we, this evening? And um, I, I hope um, I hope that um, it's been useful and, and helpful to everyone. So let's just have um, a little look at these uh, this final slide that, that we've got there. We've got here some quotations, haven't we, at the top of our screen, and they are from the prophecy of Isaiah. We've spent a little bit of time, haven't we, thinking about the great scroll of Isaiah written in Hebrew and we've got at the top then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped that's from Isaiah 35 isn't it and this is talking about the future kingdom which is promised in the book of Isaiah the prophecy it's prophesied isn't it then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So the Bible, which we've seen, is a very accurate, authentic book. And it's God's message is, is promising a time when the world will be changed. And we've seen of the Dead Sea Scrolls, haven't we, words that change the world. Well, they seriously are going to change the world, aren't they? The, 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 the scroll of Isaiah promises a fantastic time, which is going to change everything. When the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the one and only Messiah, will reign 
from Jerusalem. But the question is, are these words, is, is it just an academic study to us or will it change us? Will we respond to the call of the gospel? Thank you very much for listening. Hmm. Thank you very much, Ben, for your work for us today and for that very interesting talk this evening. Um, just a few announcements before we, we conclude. So uh, hopefully on uh, Wednesday at 8 o'clock, we will have the company of Brother Andy Thompson, and he's going to speak to us on a subject, Let Us Wise and Build. And next Sunday, God willing, Brother Peter Harvey will speak to us on Holy Spirit gifts. So we're going to sing hymn 289, which picks up on those quotes that um, Brother Ben read at the end that come from the Dead Sea Scroll. So hymn 289, a rose shall bloom in a lonely place, a wild shall echo with sounds of joy for heaven's own gladness, its bounds shall grace and forms angelic their song in joy. That's him, 280 miles. And we'll just share our audio. Mm -hmm. with a word of prayer our father which art in heaven hallowed be your great and holy name we approach you once more through your son the lord jesus thanking you for the day we've had around your word and we thank you for the evidence that you've left 
of your word and of the veracity of your word. And we thank you for the wisdom of your word and the prophecies contained within your word that give us evidence towards the hope that we have that your son will one day return to this earth and establish your kingdom. So we pray for that day to be soon. And we pray that we might have a part to play in that kingdom. We ask this prayer now for your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.